Hi, welcome to the Libra FM podcast, the monthly series where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. I'm Craig. And I'm Karen. On today's episode, we interview Nadia Odenayo, the CEO and founder of The Storygraph. And if you haven't heard of The Storygraph before, it's a website and an app that is amazing for tracking your reading. And it was founded in 2019. Yeah, I think I found Storygraph right around when they launched. Um, it was the same time that I, w- I think I found Libro as well, uh, obviously prior to working here. It was in a very de-Amazon my life type of moment where I was just trying to find replacements for all of the Goodreads and Audibles of my life. What about you? Yeah, I think same. I think I had a very similar journey around that time. Um, you'll hear more about this in the podcast, but uh, Storygraph kind of went viral on social media because people were so excited to learn about it. Um, And so I almost definitely learned about this from Instagram, I'm (laughs) guessing, uh, back in 2019. Um, Huge fan, use it all the time. Craig, what is your favorite Storygraph feature? Oh, that's a good question. And it wasn't in our script, so I wasn't prepared. But let me think think for a second. (laughs) Um, Honestly, I really, this is going to sound generic, just to say like the stats, because that's kind of their thing. Um, again, for folks that may not be familiar with the Storygraph, it does all the normal things like a Goodreads does. You can track what book you're reading, mark it as finished, start a reading challenge, etc. But what it does really well, and in a way that Goodreads doesn't do really at all, I don't think, is get into the stats. So you can see how much fiction and nonfiction you read, what pace of books you like to read, the genres, the page counts. Like it has crazy stats. Um, and I love it. I love digging into the details. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I thought you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's your favorite feature? I'll throw it back at you. Well, so I would say I like the stats, but for a different reason. Um, I like all of the ways, all of the ways that the titles are broken down because then it really helps with book discovery. It helps me find mood reads that I want at a very specific mm. moment in time. Like, it's July. I want a fast read. I don't want anything <laughs> trying. I just want to like little flippy happy, book. you know, like mm-hmm. <laughs> a you flippy. Can, I love well, a flippy happy book. A little, you know, it, it really helps you drill down into finding new and exciting content that it will be your cup of tea in general or your cup of tea at that moment in time, which is great. Love it. Well, let's not bore everyone with our love of the story graph. Let them hear it from the source <laughs> itself. Before we start the interview, if you don't follow the podcast yet, please do. And if you do, thank you. If you have a second, please rate and review it. And lastly, if you don't have a Libra membership yet, use promo code Libra Podcast and you can get two books for the price of one when you sign up for a new membership. All right, everyone, enjoy the interview. And as always, stay tuned afterwards to hear a little bit more about what Craig and I are currently reading and enjoying. Welcome to the podcast, Nadia. Craig and I have been super excited to talk to you for a long time, so we're really, really happy you're here. Um, To get started, we would love for you to introduce yourself to us and our listeners and just share a little bit more about who you are and what you've been up to. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Big Libro fan. Uh, So I'm Nadia Odaio. I am the founder, CEO, and software developer of The Storygraph. We are an indie alternative to Goodreads. And we say that we help you choose your next perfect book based on your moods and any topics or themes that you're interested in. Awesome. You mentioned that you're the CEO, founder, software developer. Um, That's a lot of hats to wear. How many people are working at Storygraph now? Like how big is your team? I stop at those three because anything more would be too much, (laughs) but I I wear several more hats. Um, But in terms of full time, it's me. And then I've got a co-founder called Rob and he does all the, any feature around machine learning or AI. So recommendations, similar users, he uh, powers that. Um, but I'm still the only software developer in that. So anything that he does, I still have to hook it into the website and app. Um, and he also manages all of our infrastructure. Um, so all our servers and things like that. And then just a general great co-founder in terms of, you know, business conversations, that kind of stuff. Um, he supports me in that. And then there's Abby, uh, Abby reads on Instagram. 
And she uh, works for us part time and she does like all sorts. So everything from she's the main uh, customer support person. So people email into support. Um, She manages our volunteer librarians uh, program and then just anything else that could over the years there's so many different things that she's done like helping to train machine learning models or um helped me right now she's helping me run the giveaways platform that we have um and then I also when I talk about the other hats I do so I'm also the product manager um I do the accounts I run the Twitter and the Instagram so I'm like a social media and the social <laughs> media manager so there's there's so several like hats that I wear uh yeah but we're so we're a tiny team and uh, indie bootstrapped all that Wow. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, so to kick things off, um, you kind of started getting into it a little bit already, but I read that Storygraph started as a like e-publication for short stories. And then you, obviously that's not what you guys do anymore. So I would love just like the short version of kind of the history of how Storygraph got kicked off. It's good that you said the short version because I could take <laughs> forever to tell the story. We have a lot of questions, um, you know, so. <laughs> okay, short version is when I was at university or what y'all call college, um, <laughs> I started, I I had a friend and we were readers, but we found that we weren't managing to read a lot. Um, and so we thought, why don't we start a short story publication uh, where u- university students around the world could write amazing short stories and we would publish them and then we'd also get custom artwork made uh, from artists around the world. And then we'd get to read more stories. Obviously, what happened was we were just managing this uh, platform or this e-publication and not actually reading stories beyond reviewing which ones were <laughs> going to go on the publication. But essentially, that was the original incarnation of the story graph. And then I shut that down some years later after I'd graduated and it, I wasn't really, there was no time for me to really manage it. So I shut it down and my mom said to me, I remember she said, don't give up the company, like the limited um, corporation, because I love the name and I feel like, you know, you could use it for something else. And I was just like, okay, mom, sure, <laughs> I'll keep it. So the company, the story graph limited just lay dormant for years and then it wasn't until the beginning of 2019 when I found myself with uh, like five years of runway because of a uh, past business partnership that I left um, uh, at the point actually in 2019 I had four years of runway and I had two side projects one was a running app and one was a reading app a reading lists app um, which was originally called read lists and I started to work on this side project but then it grew and grew and morphed into a more holistic reading uh, recommendations and tracking app. And that's when I felt like the name read list didn't fit anymore. And I remembered, oh, I've got this thing called Storygraph. (laughs) Actually, this fits. And so that's... Thanks, mom. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, mom. So she's always happy when I tell that story. Uh, But yeah, so that's the... There's basically two... The Storygraph has existed in two... um, Like two versions, essentially. Completely separate. Uh, unrelated the gap of years in between where story graph was nothing <laughs> oh, I had no idea well that kind of um makes me think of the this moment that we all witnessed and I've heard you talk about in other conversations where um bookstagram and book twitter kind of just went wild for story graph um during the pandemic and I'm so curious what that was like for you being the one person working on all of this doing social media doing all of the code like building everything um to suddenly have all of these people uh speaking about this recommending that other people join it um how did you scale all of this so quickly <laughs> during those moments so that was one of the most stressful times in the history of Storygraph. So as you mentioned, it was during the pandemic. By this point, uh, Rob had joined full time. He was about uh, six months or so into being full time. Uh, so the first year I spent completely solo. Even I think I Abby, hired Abby uh, nine months in and it was con- it's contract basis anyway. Um, so anyway, but even though Rob by that point was full time i was i was and am still the only web developer and i live alone so already it was a wild strange time being locked up alone at home and um 
yeah, we got some a series of viral tweets and we went from having a thousand users to 20,000 in three days. Wow. And the app essentially came to a standstill because so I didn't study uh, computer science or anything like that. I did a boot camp after university. And so I am like, had was relatively you know junior in the in the in the software engineering space and that you know I kind of had a boot camp but I I'd had years of experience by that point but never by myself you know running it out with that many users and because it was exploding on Twitter it was very fast paced we had like 18,000 Goodreads imports that needed doing and the the platform that I'd built just couldn't handle it I'd never built anything uh, by myself for that scale so you know previously at my the one job I did have the one software job I did have I'd either was working on new projects for startups that came through to the consultancy that I worked at which was called Pivotal Pivotal Labs um, or I was working in bigger companies where there's dozens of engineers and I was always pairing and working with a more experienced developer so actually I call them the dark days there were two weeks where the app was almost at a standstill in that no one could get Goodreads imports we shut down our recommendation service and um, I call those the dark days and I remember saying to Rob at the time several times if someone could just tell me that you're gonna get out of this um, in it doesn't matter if it's a month or two months. If someone just told me you're going to get out of this, that's fine. What I hate right now is I feel like, are we going to get out of this? Um, and there was this one particular moment, and I talk about this in a talk, a, a conference talk I did in October last year in LA, where I, there was this moment where I had to go into my bathroom and sit in the dark on the closed toilet seat. And I was like holding back tears because I'd always wanted whatever I worked on to be successful and go somewhere and I felt like oh it's finally happened and now I can't handle it and I was just on the verge of telling myself oh I can't do this it's over like you got your first spike and now StoryGraph is going to die but I didn't I didn't let myself cry and I didn't let myself say that I just like held back the tears and I remember emerging from the bathroom being like come on you can do this and eventually after two weeks of you know trying different things uh speaking to um, some friends in the industry and just figuring things out. Rob and I managed to figure out what was up and re-architect different parts of the app. Uh, and well, at this point, it was just a website, but re-architect different parts of the website such that we could support all the new people who joined. So it was, uh, when I, whenever, since then, whenever we've had any stressful periods or spikes or things like that, I always remind myself of that time because that was the the worst time and I remember thinking if we can get through if we got through that especially given you know that was what four years ago now or something so obviously right now the app is more mature I'm more advanced in what I can do it's if I remind myself that we got through that then then everything in comparison is just like a lot easier to handle yeah. God, that must have been so stressful. I'm picturing like those thousand people that were like happily using this tool. And then all of a sudden, you know, 19,000 new people are on it and now it's breaking and, you know, and you're excited that it's growing, but also, God, that must have been. <laughs> and on Twitter, we had tweets, so many tweets um, every minute, <laughs> I was going to say every hour, every day, basically saying, where's my import? Where's my Goodreads import? I've been waiting for my import. Um, yeah the days the you know memes and gifts and things and I would reply to all of them being wow. like sorry it's coming uh and, it, and it's funny because we had some snarky uh sarcastic ones and whenever I replied you, you know saying oh sorry we'll get it soon it was always like oh I wasn't really complaining just you know <laughs> it's like people didn't expect someone from the company account yeah. to yeah. reply yeah. so they would be, oh I wasn't complaining you take your time I'm just excited <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, okay. And I would always just be like, mm -hmm, okay, that was another way that you could have. Yeah, thanks. That. that was really helpful sure. feedback. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's so stressful too, because like they're like, oh, I've heard of this new platform. I'm going to jump onto it. And then if it doesn't work, do they just leave and not come back? And like as you're trying to scale the business, that's ugh. at the same time, you're trying to like re architect it. I'm sure we've got thousands and thousands of people over the years who from that time or other spikes, subsequent ones that we've had, where the app was super slow or didn't work, that have gone away and are yet to come back. Yeah. And 
uh, I always just say to myself, eventually they'll come back because uh, assuming we keep growing, we keep doing well, they're going to try it again and they'll see how much the platform has advanced and how, you know, for years now, we've just been continually improving the product and bringing new features, listening to our users. So yeah, we've definitely lost people and we will lose more people in the future. But I always just have confidence that if they uh, are a reader who likes tracking, eventually they'll try it again. And hopefully the next time they do, they stick around. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I still remember the day when I got the email that said, "Okay, you, you can you can create your story graph account now." And I was <laughs> celebrating in my house. I'm like, "It's here, so yeah. you'll get them back." Yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing both myself and and Karen and anyone else who uses story graph loves about it is the stats that you've been talking about. Um, you know, you don't get that same level of stats on other platforms. It's not just like average page count or favorite genre. It's really in depth, and you can really dig into that. Given that you were such a small team and apparently still are such a small team, prioritizing a feature like that must have been hard initially. Like what about stats felt important enough going in to build? As in, why did I have confidence that it was worth investing in building a stats portion? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different features, right? Community, adding friends, comments, reviews. Like what about stats was one of the things that felt important to build for for customers? And it's good you brought up community, actually, because I can go into it after we've, up until recently, purposefully deprioritized community. So, but to to touch on the stat side first, so I built up the user base and the features, you know, very slowly and like iterating with as small chunks as possible. So when the beta first started, I had, you know, five to 10 users and I would I actually had people pay $5 a month, I think it was. Was it a month? I think it was $5 a month. And essentially the exchange was, it was to check that I had invested testers and they would get a monthly call one-on-one with me where I'd interview them uh, and, you know, find out about their usage. But I would also, they would also have a group conversation as well. And these calls were incredibly valuable to help figure out what the next priority should be and and what value people were getting out of out of the product so yeah when the first version of the beta started it wasn't there were there was no concept of stats and again thinking of the name story graph it fits so well now but it, it didn't start as like a stats reading app even though that's now like our main or most popular section so I just remember I think I got to a point with one of my interview rounds where I was looking at all of the uh, feedback and 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 synthesizing it and analyzing it. And I think one of the things that was coming out is that, especially because in the early days, um, Storygraph was focused on mood readers in particular. It was very much people who already identified as mood readers. This is for you. And one of the pain points of mood readers was knowing what to read next and making a good choice and then sticking with the book. And I think from one of my research rounds, I remember it was coming out, what was coming out was, well, Storygraph is already helpful because it's helped me think more about the type of books that I do like with the whole mood classification thing. And so it kind, and so where the data was leading me was more towards how can I give people even more insights into their reading and new ways to think about their reading, which helps them to to choose their next book even more. And that's where I it came out to, okay, I think there needs to be a stat. Let's see what proportion of books with a certain mood you're reading. Um, and like, let's see how you're this month, like how has your reading um how have you rated books? And if you're seeing that it's a low average month, maybe you can look at what type of genres or or book size or pace you were choosing. So that's that's how it came out of my customer research and working with a small group of users and, and basically following where their feedback was taking me. What stats do people want and ask for all the time that you haven't built yet? Like, do you get a request for a certain type of stat all the time? Yeah, so the, the over the years... The one that we've actually got the most requests for is author, demographics, diversity, that kind of stuff. So I author identity stats, uh, sexuality, gender, um, location as well. In particular with sexuality and gender, originally I remember thinking, okay, great, we're going to offer this one day. But when it came to actually thinking about it and thinking about certain labels and thinking about the sensitivity of those kind of tags, 
and also the dangers around if Storygraph is seen as officially labeling authors and where that information comes from. We started to move away from saying that we wanted to offer that because there were just so many um, potential issues with it, um, the issues to cause harm, uh, to mislabel somebody. There are so many aspects to that. And if anyone uh, listening wants to re- see more about uh, the discussion that I've had around it with other users, then you can head to roadmap.thestorygraph.com. And on the in the long term uh, column, there is a post called Author Stats. Um, and you can see a conversation I've had there uh, with an author, with authors, with users, and also a link to an Instagram video I do where I talk about it in more depth. Uh, so, but what we are going to offer uh, to plus users is a way to make custom stats. So essentially a way to make your own charts and tables. And then if you want to tag your authors, you can choose what delineation you want, uh, tag your books and then get your charts. So that is one stat. Another category of stats, which uh, I know is popular and we want to do something around soon is average time taken to read a book. Mm. Um, So on our wrap up, um, I don't know if uh, you have it's, it's seen a wrap up from Storygraph, but on your wrap up, there is a over this year, it took you on average this many days to read a book. And I want to bring that to each different time period. So um, all time, year, month. So that's one that's uh, a popular one in general, uh, timings. Um, yeah, those are two two things that come to mind. Last follow up, and then sorry, Karen, we can get to your no, next no. question. Um, you mentioned roadmap, um, the roadmap that you guys have, and I've never really seen another company do that where you literally have it's like almost like your Jira board is just public information. Um, and I guess my question is like, why, why, why have that level of transparency? It's not super standard. I mean, I look at it too, right? Like, I, I really like being able to see it. Um, so, like, wh- wh- what was the decision there to be so public with that? I think it comes from earlier in the product's journey. So when I started, I was alone and I needed, I wanted some form of accountability. I also wanted to build a community. And so I started a newsletter and I, every week I would just update people on what I was doing and where it was going. And even in the first newsletter, I say something like, I don't even know if this is going anywhere, but I'm just starting this. We'll see where it goes. And I think over time, I'd seen this from other companies and also just thinking about the type of company I wanted to build. When you, particularly if you want to build like a loyal and engaged user base, I think communicating with your users and telling them what you're thinking means, one, they feel invested in the product and the journey. And I think that's very important when you're an indie bootstrapped company especially when you're in a space where I mean the biggest um competitor is Amazon owned Goodreads so I'm um, like so just having a, a base of uh invested uh users is is key and helpful um but also the story a lot of the story of success has become because of the way I prioritize customer research and talking to users and figuring out what the next step is even though I have an overall vision, I still need to check the pain points and the needs of the users and move with it, like towards that. And so I think when you're transparent and open, it also leads to more honest conversations with your customers because they know that you listen to them. They can see that you are, you know, taking on board what they're saying. And I think also, so, so, so that's one thing. And then we have so much feedback. And I also got tired of telling people it's on our radar or it's coming soon <laughs> and for each individual person especially those on twitter and instagram they can think i'm just saying that so that they uh i that that ends the conversation and so the roadmap was also a way of saying no look i i i i am aware of this point and i am aware of this feature it's on our radar it's literally on the roadmap look at all the other people who've suggested it look at all what uh, look at how it can work the other way where someone could say something and then I show a roadmap post that's like, well, look at someone who thinks the opposite. So you can see why we haven't done anything on this yet because we literally have hundreds of people who want it this way. And it just it's just a, it's just such a useful tool in having more effective conversations with 
users and also of showing them that they are heard and they are being listened to. And I think that's just so powerful in building a product. Everything that you just said is like tugging at my heartstrings because um, my role at LibreFM is customer experience and our, uh-huh. our voice of the customer program. And so I, I yes, I relate to all of this <laughs> so much. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what some of those mechanisms are that you're using to get the feedback. Um, I know from my experience that there's definitely some science in it. Like there are quantifiable things that come through, but there is an art as well because you get just a lot of, um, you know, conversational feedback from people. So how do you, how do you take all of that into consideration as you're, as you're building the roadmap? So many different factors. And um, I will say that at the, at the base of it or at the core of it, there is still some level of gut and intuition because there, we literally have thousands of people tens of thousands on our Instagram and Twitter um thousands of plus users and they will get access to the roadmap and there are so many that's why I mentioned having a vision it's important to have a vision because you can you need to listen to customers in the right way you can listen to people and then just do everything they say and end up with a product that has no clear direction um does so many things such that everybody is confused um so I would say there is even though there is a uh, science to it and I'll get into some of my specific methods in a, in a second I do want to say that at the core like when I'm approached with something there's always a there is an initial like definitely maybe definitely not like we have a there is a you you do have a sense of like no that's not f- for the product it doesn't fit into the vision or it doesn't fit into or it's just so low down the priority ladder that it's I'm just not even going to think about it right now to okay, maybe you're interesting or, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way to, oh, this is definitely on the plan. It's just about when. So there's that. And then there's different levels of feedback. Part of the gut and intuition as well comes from not only having a product uh, vision and, you know, given that I built the product as well, that really helps in terms of just being in tune with what is, uh, where it's going. And also being that I'm a reader and particularly on the Instagram, I there's 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 the product side but there's also the Nadia side where I share what I'm reading and so that helps me relate to readers um and also understand um understand their needs a great example actually is I never listened to audiobooks I listened to my first audiobook last year I think or maybe two, maybe it was in 2021 actually but I always said they're not for me in the sense that I love music and podcasts um, and I would just always be like, I don't have time to listen to audiobooks. And the way with 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 podcasts, it's it's okay because if you lose attention, you can either continue on or go back. With music, it doesn't matter about your attention. And I just thought it just wasn't for me, and I didn't know where I'd fit it in. But I had so much feedback from audiobook listeners, such that when um, Libro came along with the ALC program, I remember being like, yes, I need to get on it. I need to start listening to audiobooks. And then I had uh, increased understanding of the pain points that audio uh, readers had. So that, so that's so that's another example of how like just fine tuning that gut, that intuition and understanding the needs. Then there's a whole scale of customer research methods. At the most basic, it's yeah, it's just, you know, hearing from everyone on social media. But I like to do polls on Instagram and Twitter, especially when it's a case of we know we want to do this thing or I think I want to change this thing. Let's just do a straight poll. And if the if if it's if it's very heavily one way, then let me just implement that change because we know that we that, that we suspect that people, the vast majority would prefer it another way. Let's do that. So that's like the most basic form of like uh a research method um and then on the other end of the scale it's actual customer research rounds and so this in- involves figuring out what the hypothesis is f- for the round um figuring out how many people i want to interview for a round it's often minimum five five to like eight ten really writing the script for the interview so actually f- writing a script that you know doesn't have leading questions make sure that i'll have enough information to answer the hypothesis um, all that kind of stuff. Conducting the interviews, I record them, I do them on Zoom, I record them, I watch them back, taking out, uh, you know, notes, and again, unbiased notes, so actually uh, taking like word for word what people say, summaries, and not trying to put my own bias into it, laying all of those out in on, on a virtual um, 
whiteboard and figuring out what the themes and the patterns are and then putting that eventually in a spreadsheet and figuring out okay these were the key learnings what are the next steps based on that and more recently um a few months ago I did my first ever bout of usability testing because we did a big redesign and so that was different so that involved developing mock-ups and then figuring out what are the pain points with the current design so therefore setting up uh, uh, user interviews where people had to do tasks because the point is you know everyone says I don't know where to go to add a review so let's do the redesign and one of the tasks is where would you go to add a review here and um uh having so we actually had score score scores for that like success or no success, how many tries, what was the pain threshold, use that to assess, is this design a go or a no-go, and then implementing the design. And so that's that's the, more, the most scientific type of user testing that I've done, because um, we literally had averages of the pain scale. And and the, the amazing thing of why this works is, so before the redesign, I had, because the design, we've had like three or four design iterations, but in the one before the current one, I had put the ad review link above the title. And so like at least once a week, we would have one person saying, I don't, where do you add reviews on StoryGraph? Mm -hmm. um, and and so when I did the, the usability testing, and again, I had different cohorts. So I had everything from, I had active users, um, active and happy users, people who used it but struggled, people who tried it and didn't like it and left. Mm -hmm. And then we had those three across mobile and desktop. And... Um, there was only one task out of all the tasks that was 100% first try success rate, zero pain. And that was add a review. And since the redesign has gone live, we've not had a single person, and we would have a handful every week. We've not had a single person ask us, how do you add a review? So it works. And yeah. and so, yeah, so that, that's just an insight into the range of techniques uh, when I do customer research. Oh my that's gosh, awesome. thank you for sharing yeah. that. I can tell Craig's eyes are lighting up too. Craig is our, our user testing <laughs> Oh, yeah, at Libro too, so. yeah I, I do design at Libro, so we do a lot of user oh. testing as well. And I was like, oh, this is all, love to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> um, so obviously we all know that, and you mentioned it, that Amazon is kind of like the Goliath in this sector with Kindle and Audible and Goodreads all under that umbrella. Um, and I'm, why do you think it's so important that indie alternatives exist? You know, companies like the Storygraph and Libro, um, like why is that so important for folks? I think, I mean, I think it's important on a few levels. In general, I used Goodreads from since 2012. And there was a time in my life where it was my favorite app. And I remember at some point, maybe it would have been, so I started using it in 2012. Maybe it was around 2015 or 2016. I remember just having the thought, I didn't hate Goodreads. I never got to the point where I was like, oh, I hate this app. But I remember <laughs> like thinking, it hasn't changed at all in the, in the yeah. four or five years I've been using it. Like, that's strange. And then being like, it's owned by Amazon, isn't it? Like, don't, don't they have a lot of money? Like, I don't really, <laughs> yeah. like, I don't understand. Why has it not changed at all? And so I think one of the reasons why just having indie alternatives in general in any space is a good idea is because it just, you know, humans, we're creative. People have a range of different ideas, a range of different perspectives. And I think it's just, you just, you, there's something for everyone. Like people have alternatives. People can, um, you know, find the product that suits them. It forces people when, when a space is more competitive and there's different, um, and when I don't mean competitive in like a, like a negative sense, just in that there's a few, a few players. It just means that um, it incentivizes the creators to, you know, really try and cater to a particular group, to keep innovating, to keep iterating. Um, so I just think it's better for everyone involved in that respect of just the fact that as users, as consumers, there are just more options, more chances to find something that fits you and fits your needs. Um, because I just think it's such a shame that, you know, a tool like Goodreads just hasn't innovated and they've got all the resource to. Um, and then obviously there's the whole side of for authors and publishers, I think authors in particular, when you've got an entity that has a monopoly, it just means that they're not getting, you know, competitive rates. They're not, they're not getting like the money or the, um, yeah, the money that they deserve for all of their work as well. So uh, those are the the high level, two of the main reasons. Totally. With a company that has like unlimited money and sway, like they can go into publishers and demand certain things that, you know, smaller, smaller companies can't like, how do you think companies like ours 
will survive, you know, why either by like not being acquired and just, you know, rolled in or just, you know, being over, like undercut in a lot of ways. Like how do we continue to survive? So this is, it kind of touches on the stuff that we've spoken about previously in terms of building that community with, with our users, being transparent and being open and honest with them. Because I think, well, there's, they always say with startups that timing is key. Mm -hmm. So I felt like if I had started to build Storygraph back in 2012 or back in 2013, probably would not have survived then. But, but whereas now there is so much, there's, 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 kind of an anti there's a big anti amazon uh sentiment in the in the tech in the just in general in the publishing industry rather mm -hmm. um there's a general kind of distrust of big tech companies um the whole venture capital space things like that so the timing is also right um and actually one of the reasons why we exploded in the pandemic is because a bunch of these things came to a head which was um, I remember there was a whole thing about Jeff Bezos getting richer during the pandemic. And then there were all the things about Amazon workers. Um, uh, it was also a pandemic and we were, it feels weird to talk about being fortunate for things that are out of the pandemic. But one of the things was reading is very durable. You know, people were reading. So that didn't stop. Um, if anything, some people were reading more because they now had the time or they had screen fatigue. Um, and then there was already the, the you know, dis the dislike of the fact that Goodreads hadn't innovated or, or changed. So there is a timing factor as to why um, companies like Storygraph and Libra FM are doing well now. And I think to keep doing well, it's to keep talking to, to customers, keep being transparent and honest about, you know, what we're doing and why. And I think there's something that you can't change, but which um, is, is in the makeup of our companies, which is that it started by people who care and who are actually readers and who, you know, care about this. And that's a, you can't change that. But I think that's part of why the companies have been doing well, because people, when they interact with us on social media, um, they can see like, oh, wow, the pe there are people behind this who care, who are readers. They get that good vibe because it's all genuine. Um, and yeah, and then I think hopefully it's, I just yeah. And I just think if we keep... Um, iterating innovating you can't it doesn't matter even if you've got unlimited resources i mean we see it now um if you don't care and you don't have the incentive to you're not going to iterate and keep your customers happy um so i think having the resources and it also even if you have all the money and all the resources if you don't care if you don't um know how to do customer research properly if you if there's no like vision or mission underpinning then the money won't be well spent and you know the, you can have a huge team um but you're going to move slowly or you're going to get into like you're going to get stuck because ultimately the, the the core foundation isn't there yeah that reminds me of what you said earlier about the surprise people had when you would respond to their individual tweets and they're like, oh, you're <laughs> actually there. You're listening. I I experienced that a lot with customer support too. When we reply and people are like, oh, I'm not, I, are you, you're not a bot. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yep. Yep. Still have that today, every day. <laughs> Um, kind of on a more personal note. So, um, you mentioned that you did this talk, I think it was the rails SAS conference yes. um, in Los Angeles recently. And to everyone who's listening, this, the whole talk is on YouTube. I watched the entire thing. It is amazing. Oh. I highly recommend that everyone watches that video. Um, something that just was so motivating and inspiring to me was hearing about your academic career and your early career and kind of what led you to the point of being the founder and the developer at Storygraph. Um, so I'm curious for myself and also our listeners, um, what advice you have to folks who want to use their skills that they've developed for something different, something disruptive, um, something to make the book community better or just the the other communities they're in in general? Um, thank you for watching the talk and for your very kind words about it. Um, yeah, that means a lot. Um, I think if you have, if, if you have, something at the back of your mind that's nagging you and you think oh I, I want to do something in this space I feel like there's something I could do um definitely explore it and exploring it this is the thing it doesn't mean you have to quit your current job uh it doesn't mean yeah you have to like throw everything away and um you can one of the things that I wish people in general 
new or thought is that there are ways to test things cheaply. And what I mean by that is it could just be an hour doing research online. It could be setting up a couple of calls with people in the space or a potential user. It could be reading a couple of, you know, books or uh, uh, doing a, a landing page or something. There are certain, depending on what you're doing and what your skill set is. Um, and so what I would say is I would actually, I would actually recommend <laughs> taking a look at that Rails SaaS talk I did because it's essentially my playbook or my tips for the pillars of starting something um, by yourself and doing something independently. And ultimately, I would say start with talking to people and I would recommend the mum test by Rob Fitzpatrick. And I talk about that in, in the talk. Uh, it's a super short book. You can read it in one sitting in less than an hour. And it it's all about how do you talk with people such that they give you helpful feedback. And the reason it's called the mum test is because in general, your mum is always supportive of what you're doing and would say it's great. And so this interview technique is such that even your mum won't know that, oh, this is my child's idea. And so I'm going to be supportive. They're just going to be upfront and honest. It's called the mum test. Um, so I would recommend um, just carving out some time in your week and thinking about, OK, what are the little steps I can do to test if this is something worth doing? What are the skills I need to learn? Let me also have some short conversations with people. Um, just 20 minutes. Most of my customer interviews are 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. I know some people do ones that are hour long, but I don't think you that they ever need to be that long, um, you know, within reason, depending on what you're doing. Um, and just get started and and um immerse yourself in the community of whatever it is you want to do. So before I even started building Storygraph, when I had an idea, I in the first few months, I didn't even build anything alongside talking to people I went to events I went to the London book fair I went to the panel panel discussions I just immersed myself in the industry and that's another thing that you can do and there can be I think for all for all communities there is an in-person component there's also a digital online component awesome. thank you so much I hope I hope there are little solopreneurs listening to this right yeah. now <laughs> I'm like okay I'm starting my thing <laughs> and I always tell people like if you if if you do something and I inspired you to do something, tweet at me and let me know how you're doing. Um, because I'm always, yeah, I'm always, I've always got time for people who are, you know, trying to be entrepreneurial and start something. And especially solo, it, it can be scary. There were definitely moments in the first year of Storygraph where I would just be alone in my house, especially during the pandemic it, when, it, when it got to 2020. But even in 2019, I'd just be alone at my house and just be like, Boy, what am I doing? Like, well, this is ridiculous. <laughs> just me, and I'm, I'm trying to build a whole reading tracking app. This is wild. <laughs> Wait, and, and especially when I got, I did some research rounds where the feedback was suggesting I don't really have anything compelling because I worked through that as well. And it would, could have been, you know, I, I, I realizing that if I just said, okay, I'm done with this, like, that's it, it would just stop. That would also be like, wow, okay, is this worth continuing? <laughs> you know, it can be quite scary. So, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to me on on um, Twitter or Mastodon, at N or Dial on both. And we can maybe share the links. But, yeah, I'm I'm always open to talk with people about next steps for their entrepreneurial ventures. Awesome. It's so another great reason to use small indies instead of Amazon. I don't think you can just, like, reach out to Jeff for feedback, <laughs> you know? Like, you're very no. available. Yeah. No, you um, can't. He's too busy in a rocket or something. I don't, um, I don't know if he would want to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah that's yeah, very same. true. He's not on my list of people I want to talk to. Um, so our last question before we get into – our last serious question before we get into our lightning round that we told you about – is um, we all love Storygraph and love the stats features and the tracking features and community and reviews. And as someone who talks to users constantly, could you give us a little bit of insight into what's coming next for Storygraph feature-wise? What should we all Ooh. be excited about? Okay, so historically, the main thing is historically we have said that we I have deprioritized community features for a bunch of reasons. One being that when I started it, I remember online seeing a lot of people talking about being burnt out from social media, mm. even burnt out, out from Goodreads because pe they'd get into arguments with people on their on their reviews and all that kind of stuff. And I just said, I don't want to build something that anyone can get burnt out from. Like, I just don't want to build something. We don't need another social media app. 
And then the other side of it was things like commenting, friends, all that kind of stuff, they're solved problems. That was never going to be a differentiator. You could always add that stuff later as we eventually did with following and and friends and things like that. So why spend time, especially being a solo dev, building out commenting? Once you build that commenting, you've got to worry about moderation and privacy and blocking users, all that kind of stuff. So for those reasons, we have said, we're just putting it on like hold for now. We're not worrying about it. Um, And then we've continued to grow over the years. And we've now got to the point where we have, I mean, we've got 1.6 million registered users. We've got four to five million people who use the app and website every um, month because you can use it and get value and browse without having an account. And it's gotten to the point where the sticking point is now becoming, oh, but all my friends are on Goodreads or, you know, it's, it's um, my reading group is on, on Goodreads. And so for the latter half of this year, something that we're going to focus on more is community. And it doesn't mean we're still going to be very intentional and careful about how we do it. We still want to do it differently and in a, in a refreshing way. So it doesn't mean that suddenly it's going to be commenting and DMs. So it's going to be, we're going to be more intentional about what we do and really make, um, try want to give StoryGraph a unique feel. So we've already got our buddy read feature. We're definitely going to be taking that to the next level. Uh, we want to do a, a book club feature and we've got some really cool ideas for what we're going to have for book clubs um, and other like reading group um, features. We um, even just things such as like right now to you start a buddy read, you go into the app and you say, I want to start a buddy read for this book. And then you put in the um, usernames that you want. You have to already know the usernames, all of that. We want to do it another way where you can see like what are people can just post like, I want to buddy read this with someone and people can join or people can share a link on Instagram, on Twitter, and you can click to join. So just ways to bring people in, uh, ways to um, uh, find friends both in real life and also on other online communities. So just working on um, the community aspect is something that we're excited to get to. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I can't wait. Thank you for sharing the roadmap there with us. You know, (laughs) feeling like a plus member right now. Yeah, yes. yes. I mean, which I am anyway, but. Oh, are you? Amazing. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm excited to let you know, Nadia, we have made it to the lightning round. Um, So the lightning round are a series of, I think, five or six questions that are, some of them are ridiculous, some of them are not, um, but just really quick uh, little zingers that we will shoot your way. (laughs) All right. So as a reader, if you could visit one fictional place or world from a book, where would it be? (laughs) I've only read a lot of dark fantasy lately. So I guess I can't, I would want to explore, but not actually live there. And that's the stillness um, from the, the Broken Earth trilogy, which is like an alternate Earth world. Um, do you reread books that you love? No. In fact, the books that I have recently, the first time I reread a book was actually a few years ago. And that's because of, I was inspired to do so because of the Bookstagram community. But beforehand, I was very much of the life's too short. You're not going to read all the books you want to read. No time to reread. But I now see the benefits and the comfort from rereading. So I, I, I've i reread a few a few books. What was the book that you reread for the first time? Um, the Secret History was one. Perfect choice. Yep. I, like I think everyone at Libra has also reread that book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know now I know the kind of history of where the story graph name came from. So maybe this question doesn't make sense anymore. But when you were thinking about launching the story graph um, in its newer iteration, were there any other names in the maybe pile that um, it was almost going to be called? Well, read lists. Right. Read lists, <laughs> which is the original name. And then... I didn't, I honestly just went straight to StoryGraph after that. I didn't have to go through that really stressful thing of figuring out what the name is going to be. If you had unlimited time and unlimited resources, how would you spend your day? Reading. (laughs) Reading, (laughs) Alternating between reading and going to dance class. I love it. (laughs) Reading and dancing are my two main hobbies. So I just alternate between those two. And maybe I try writing too. I have a follow-up question on dancing in a moment. Yes. (laughs) What's something that improved the quality of your life so much that you wish you had done it sooner? Ooh, I think, I think it's discovering dance class actually in that I only started going when I left university and I wish I started doing it earlier because it's just, it just makes me so happy. It's so much fun. It's like, just like reading, it's a form of escape. So 
All right. Our last uh, lightning round question. If you are at trivia night, what is the category that you absolutely crush? Right now, the Luther, the BBC Luther TV series. Because I'm rewatching it to watch the um, movie. Yep. And so it's very fresh. So I could, I would do very well. <laughs> but I always say, like, I feel like I know a lot about a lot of things just very generally. I'm such a generalist. So I'm always like, oh, I'm not a good, I'm not a good quiz person. Um, but yeah, I, if, if I could choose that topic, I would do that. A Luther, <laughs> Luther dedicated trivia. I love it. Literally. It's that too serious. Series one to three in particular. <laughs> so our last segment before we say goodbye is Instagram story time, where we comb through your Instagram and pick a picture or video that we want to know more about. Ooh. So we mentioned there was a dance question coming up. So Karen, <laughs> take it away. Yes. Oh, wow. I'll say usually Craig and I kind of go back in the Instagram archives to get something that's like, you know, maybe a few months old, a couple of years old. Um, but your most recent post, and I think it's also pinned on your account, just blew us both away. It is for everyone who's listening, please go check this out. It's amazing. It's like a it's a dance video of Nadia dancing that is a professional music video starring you. <laughs> it's so awesome. Um, and you mentioned in the caption that it was for your nine year dance anniversary. So you've been on the dance journey for a while. Um, can you, what's the deal? Tell us more about this. <laughs> um, so, wow. Yeah. So I started, that was on March 10th, my dance anniversary. So nine years ago from March 10th, I walked into this dance class Um and it was with this particular teacher called Joelle de Fontaine. And I remember that I um, was trying to, there was a studio around the corner from where I worked. And I was just trying to, just, there were so many classes on offer. And I remember his was the second like profile, teacher profile I looked at. And I just really liked, he just had this like pose that like this, like you know, <laughs> like his head cocked onto his, his fist. And I remember being like, ah, I like his vibe. So I went <laughs> and um, yeah, I just, you know, I ended up, you know, dancing with him for years. And then when it got to, I remember my first, ever class I went home and I filmed the video and I thought I was good at dancing like really good I was like oh my god look at this and I was showing my friends uh, my boyfriend at the time and now I look back and honestly this video is so bad it's hilarious <laughs> I, I cannot watch it without laughing um, it's the kind of thing that when I hear other people who come to dance class and I overhear them saying things like wow you're so good I could never be that good and I say to them, no, 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 you should see how I started. And they'll say, no, 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 there's no way. And I'll say, trust me, you dance better than I did when I started. And I show them this video. It's like they were protesting and then they're like not protesting anymore. <laughs> and they're like, oh, OK. You know, it's the kind of it's like almost famous in my dance circles. So anyway, when it got to my five years, I remember saying, oh, my gosh, I would do that first one so much better now. So I kind of I re I did it again and I put them side by side or posted them back to back. Um, and then ever since then, because I'm such a like I love doing projects and those, those kind of goals and milestones, that kind of thing. M nearly every year since then, I have done um, a video or produced a special type of content. Um, and the year before last year, it was just it was a it was just a great dance video. It was one of, it was, it was a, this was the eighth year one. And then me being me said, OK, now I have to do something even better than this year. <laughs> and I just had this vision and I I realized it was just the, basically my vision came to life. And so because of the success of this video, I've now said to Joelle, like, OK, year 10 is the last year because now I want to do something even better. And I can't <laughs> keep putting this pressure on myself. So I'm going to do a final thing like for my 10th year next month. Much, and then that will be that but yeah I so I, yeah. until the 11th year where you feel like you have to do it again no I can't <laughs> I, I'm gonna publicly I'm, I'm gonna publicly say it's 10th year's the end and probably I'll just keep reposting old ones on a few years but yeah thank you so much for sharing that and Craig and I as we were watching this we're like you are just so talented and good at so many things they were like how do you have enough hours in the day to do all of yeah. these things yeah and that was before I knew you could also do user testing and research oh. <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> It's my calendar. Live, live by my calendar. People, yeah. people ask me that. And like, I have my hour. Actually, yeah, that's something that I didn't mention before. Like putting an hour reading in my calendar every day is just so, it's been so helpful to actually get reading done um, and to prioritize it. And people often say to me, oh, surely since you started StoryGraph, your reading has gone down. If anything, it's gone, it's like doubled, tripled. Well, not quite tripled yet, but like it's, it's getting there. Um, and it's because one, it's like, 
it, 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 it being part of the books community and building a product for books, it's gotten me even more excited about reading. But also so many more books have come onto my radar that I really want to read. And um, it's also just like, it feels like part of my work but in a not in a way that's like it becomes a chore but it's like no I should make time to read because that this has been serving me well like identifying as a reader and being able to actually have great conversations with friends I've made from the community all right we have made it to the end of the podcast thank you so much (laughs) for your time (laughs) um we always end with a little bit of a self-serving question where we ask you for recommendations on what we should be reading next so either something that you're reading now or read recently that you would like to um, share the good word about? I really, um, I'll do fiction and nonfiction since I, I typically always have one on the go, both. So I really liked, um, the most riveting, gripping nonfiction I've read this year, um, is American Kingpin, uh, the, by Nick Dalton, the epic hunt for the criminal mastermind behind Silk Road. And um, that is just, I, I love the kind of narrative, nonfiction, fast paced, drama filled, especially especially because my life is very like low, there's like no drama in my life. So when I read <laughs> nonfiction that's packed with drama, I'm like, wow, people out here are really living uh, <laughs> some wild <laughs> lives. And then um, I will actually recommend, uh, I'll recommend an audio book that I, I got through the um, uh, Libro a- ALC and it's a it was it's a romance book. Again, romance is a genre that only I started to explore because of the Bookstagram community. Um, and it's thank you for listening. And it's just a lovely, um, it's just it's just a lovely book. And um, there's like a meta aspect to it, um, which if you read it or you check out the blurb, you'll know what I mean. But if you like romance and you like audio, then thank you for listening is perfect for you. Yes, and Julia Whalen is a national treasure, so it's yeah, lovely. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't typically ask this question, but given that you are a founder of a company and a startup that we all love, we also would like to ask you for a recommendation of any other small companies or startups that we should be users of. Ooh, well, the first thing that came to mind is actually my weightlifting app. Oh. So um, <laughs> that's right up my alley, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's called uh, Stronglifts 555. And I think it's a one man team in that I've used it for, I don't know how many years now, seven, eight years. And whenever I email in, I get the response from the same guy, Mehdi. And um, yeah, if you are, it's perfect for whether you're um, used to weightlifting and you just want a new program and you haven't done the strong list 555 one, or you have been hearing that, oh, I should get weightlifting into my workout regime. I've heard strength training is good. Um, uh, it, it's a great app to get started with. You start from, uh, there's like five core lifts. It's a uh, five, you lift three times a week. Um, and everything is in there, like the, the way to track it, the videos, lots of notes, lots of docs. So yeah, I would say strong list five by five. It's called. I'm going to download that immediately when, <laughs> <laughs> when we sign off. <laughs> awesome. Nadia, thank you so much for spending an hour with us today. This has been an absolute dream. Um, and we just can't wait to continue cheering on StoryGraph and seeing all the success that you have and, and partnering with you at Libro FM. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. The hour flew by. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to that interview. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, Getting to talk to Nadia was amazing. I love the story graph and I love it even more now. Absolutely. She is so inspiring to me, as you can probably tell from how much I fangirled out on this episode. Uh, it was so lovely to get to to get to talk to her. I know. I like. I knew Storygraph was a small team, kind of like Libro, but I didn't realize that it was like... Nadia. Yeah, it was 2.5 <laughs> people, you know, yeah. like, like working in an apartment. It's amazing how large they have grown and the features that they put out and how stable the app and site are and with that few of people. It's yes. amazing. And just her ability to learn new things and take the plunge. And I just, that's how I want to be. So yeah, And read a million books and be a dancer and give <laughs> TED Talks. What yes. the hell? <laughs> yep. Yep. I need that number of hours in my day, please. <laughs> yes. So, Karen. 
It has yes. come to that time of the podcast. Mm -hmm. I would love to know what you are reading right now. Oh, okay. Well, I just finished. <laughs> You're why do you act surprised? This is episode like 20. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, using my theater degree. Okay, so I just finished reading Come and Get It by Kylie Reed. And I will preface this by saying that Kylie Reed's novel, Such a Fun Age, which came out, I think a couple of years ago, is one of my favorite books of all time. I love that book. If you haven't read it, please do. Um, Come and Get It comes out in January. It is about a bunch of drama and the relationships between young women on a college campus in the South. I don't want to say too much more as always, because I don't want to spoil anything, but I super enjoyed it. Huge Kylie Reed fan. Can we please ask her to be on the podcast? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we right. should, especially if that's not coming out until January. Yeah. Uh, I would love to speak to her. Shoot, shoot an email. Perfect. And then, you know what? I'm just going to be completely transparent that as I said in the intro, it is summertime. I'm interested in happy, flippy, fun books right now. And when our team was in San Diego, we went to, a group of us went to the cutest bookstore. It's called Meet Cute. And it is a romance bookstore that is just so impeccably curated. I cannot say this enough. Like the staff there is absolutely killing it at deciding what content comes into this bookstore, how it's categorized. Um, so while I was there, I purchased a book called American Queen, which is a romance novel. I've been very much enjoying that this summer. I will say it is not for young readers. <laughs> um, rated R plus, uh, but it's been really great. And it's a trilogy. Um, R, R plus. <laughs> are you making a, up a rating? <laughs> no. I think so. NC, I would say it's NC-17. X rated, but... Um, I finished the first one this week and I have already gone to my local bookstore and purchased the next two in the trilogy. Cause the I'm, next two. Yeah. There's, oh, you're, you're in it now for sure. Oh, absolutely. And I should say, so the author of this trilogy is Sierra Simone, who I think has written several other romance novels of different varieties. Um, and I really enjoy her work. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm up to. What are you reading, Craig? Um, I love it. I, um, I never read Such a Fun Age. Obviously, I know that book was huge. I don't know why I thought that was like a nonfiction. Is it not? No. Oh, and it's one of your favorite books ever? I love it. Wow. I absolutely love it, yes. All right. Well, I'm on it. Great. Um, I am reading, or I have two. One that I just finished and one that I'm currently reading. Just finished, even though you asked me what I'm currently reading, I'm so excited to talk about this book that I'm going to squeeze <laughs> it in there. Um, you probably already know about this because I have been talking about this book nonstop and I read it in like 18 hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> called The Art Thief by Michael Finkel. It is the story of Stefan Breitweiser, who has been described as the world's most consistent art thief. Um, this is a nonfiction. <laughs> what a title. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, he literally... so. Spoiler, this happened in the 90s and it's a nonfiction. It was in the news. So this is not a spoiler. Consistent because he stole a piece of art like once a week for like eight years. That's insane. Just, like so I can't I, think of anything I do once a week like for that long. <laughs> like We don't even um, podcast that often. <laughs> yeah. And he like didn't like to work. He like would pick up odd jobs here and there like as a waiter or whatever, like just to like literally keep the lights on like he lived in his mom's attic like his mom had like an you know an ancillary space above her apartment and just let him live in there and by um again spoiler alert he does get caught eventually hence there's why there's a book about it um when all was said and done he had two billion dollars worth of art in his like mother's attic it's absurd. I, I, it defies logic. I <laughs> yeah, and the, the best part about it is this isn't like the Isabella Stort Gardner in Boston where they like beat up the security guards and tied them up and locked them to a pipe and then like cut the canvases out in the dead of night. He just did all of this during normal hours. He would just walk in, buy a ticket, and just pick stuff up and leave. I <laughs> like, like, like he was stealing like a uh, chapstick from CVS or something. It was just him and his like girlfriend. She would like keep an eye out and he would just take stuff off the wall and walk away with it. Anyway. It's, it's got to be like the 
the purloined letter situation where it's just happening in such plain sight that if you're observing this, you're like, this must be correct because no one in their right mind would come in here and do this. Like this must be some art dealer that's supposed to be here. (laughs) Exactly. And this also wasn't in the like 1920s before security camera. This was like in like 1998. Like (laughs) they had security cameras, like just anyway, it's not that long. I think the audio is seven hours or something. Um, It is so good. If you're into art, nonfiction, heist, it's also told in a very, like, it almost reads like a novel. Anyway, go buy this book. I went to my local bookstore, Book Suite in Ann Arbor, last week, and I they ordered it for me, and I cannot wait. It's so good. <laughs> it's very page turnery. Um, well, I just took up the entire podcast talking about The Art Thief, um, I will blaze through what I'm currently listening to so that I answer your question. Um, I am currently reading Looking Glass Sound by Catriona Ward. She did... Um, the Last House on Needless Street. It's good so far. I'm about a halfway in. Honestly, like, I know I've said this before, but it kind of reads like a Stand By Me, Coming of Age, Stephen Kingish horror book. It's hard awesome. to explain, but it's very good. The general gist is the um, family, the family's kind of on the rocks. They go spend the summers on this cute town in Maine, which again is probably why I'm getting Stephen King vibes because it takes place in Maine. Murders happen. Things ensue. I don't. It's very good. <laughs> it's very thrillery, but horror, but also just like very coming of age. This young man is finding himself, and um, you know, it's very good. Fantastic. Yeah. I will add that to my list as well. Yeah. Read the art. They're both great, but read the art thief first because I'm obsessed with it. I will. I'm, I'm hoping- dying to talk about Stefan Breitweiser with everybody. I'm hoping my phone rings at any moment and it is the book suite <laughs> staff saying, hello, please swing by. Your book is here and I will fly Your book is not there. here. Someone stole it. <laughs> it was <laughs> the book Stephon Brightweather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, before we let you all go, I wanted to briefly tease the two upcoming interviews that we have. I'm very excited about them. The next person we're interviewing is James McBride, who is an author of uh, most recently Deacon King Kong, which was a bestseller, was huge a couple of years ago. Um, Loved that book. He has a new book coming out called The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store, um, which Craig and I will be reading before we chat with him uh, and we'll get all of the scoop on that. And then after that, we are going to interview Danny Kane, who runs and owns Raven Bookstore. And also, you may know because he wrote How to Resist Amazon and Why. And we're going to interview him and talk about his bookstore and um, why independent bookstores matter and his book and everything. And we're super, super excited. So those are our next two episodes. The Danny episode is very fun for me because at the beginning of this podcast we say we talk to authors narrators booksellers and more and danny is all of those things <laughs> he, <laughs> he wrote is so a book, more he narrated it and he runs a bookstore so yes. we have tons of questions for him yes 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 so like we said at the beginning of the episode if you are not a libro member yet sign up for a membership use code libro podcast and you'll get two books for the price of one and as always thank you for listening <laughs> <laughs>